friend, go up higher. When the first, the life of grace, begins in the soul, we do indeed draw near to God, but it is with great fear and trembling, the soul conscious of guilt, and humbled thereby is overawed with the solemnity of its position. It is cast to the earth by a sense of the grandeur of Jehovah, in whose presence it stands. With unfeigned bashfulness it takes the lowest room. But in afterlife, as the Christian grows in grace, although he will never forget the solemnity of his position, and will never lose that holy awe which must encompass a gracious man when he is in the presence of the God who can create or can destroy, yet his fear has all its terror taken out of it. It becomes a holy relevance and no more an overshadowing dread. He is called up higher to greater access to God in Christ Jesus. Then the man of God, walking amid the splendors of deity and veiling his face like the glorious cherubim with those twin wings, the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, will reverent and bowed in spirit approach the throne, and seeing there a God of love, of goodness and of mercy, he will realize rather the covenant character of God than his absolute deity. He will see in God rather his goodness than his greatness, and more of his love than his majesty. Then will the soul, bowing still as humbly as aforetime, enjoy a more sacred liberty of intercession. For while prostrate before the glory of the infinite God, it will be sustained by the refreshing consciousness of being in the presence of the boundless mercy and infinite love, and by the realization of acceptance in the Beloved. Thus the believer is bidden to come up higher, and is enabled to exercise the privilege of rejoicing in God, and drawing near to Him in holy confidence, saying, Abba, Father. So may we go from strength to strength, and daily grow in grace, till in thine image raised at length we see thee face to face. The night also is thine. Yes, Lord, thou dost not abdicate thy throne when the sun goeth down, nor dost thou leave the world all through these long wintry nights to be the prey of evil. Thine eyes watch us as the stars, and thine arms surround us as the zodiac belts the sky. The dew of kindly sleep and all the influences of the moon are in thy hand, and the alarms and solemnities of night are equally with thee. This is very sweet to me when watching through the midnight hours, or tossing to and fro in anguish. There are precious fruits put forth by the moon as well as by the sun. May my Lord make me to be a favoured partaker in them. The night of affliction is as much under the arrangement and control of the Lord of love as the bright summer days when all is bliss. Jesus is in the tempest, his love wraps the night about itself as a mantle, but to the eye of faith the sable robe is scarce a disguise. From the first watch of the night, even to the break of day, the eternal watcher observes his saints and overrules the shades and dews of midnight for his people's highest good. We believe in no rival deities of good and evil contending for the mastery, but we hear the voice of Jehovah saying, I create light and I create darkness. I, the Lord, do all these things. Gloomy seasons of religious indifference and social sin are not exempted from the divine purpose when the altars of truth are defiled and the ways of God forsaken. The Lord's servants weep with bitter sorrow, but they may not despair, for the darkest eras are governed by the Lord and shall come to their end at his bidding. What may seem defeat to us may be victory to him. Though enwrapped in gloomy night, we perceive no ray of light. Since the Lord himself is here, tis not meet that we should fear.